So prayer is something that has been practiced by people throughout time, and not all of them faithful followers of God, which makes it a little bit confusing. Every major world religion has something that can be called prayer. Scientific researchers have even done studies to show the benefits of prayer in mental, physical, and even emotional health. And it would seem that even in the midst of disciples of Jesus, prayer is something that's almost always included with another sacred rhythm. Something like uh, prayer and fasting, prayer and devotion, prayer and worship. So the opportunity to dive into just the rhythm of prayer is a great opportunity for us as disciples of Jesus. Grab your Bibles, grab your neighbor's Bible and help them. Grab your kid's Bible and help them and go to Luke chapter 11. The Gospel of Luke chapter 11. In this section of Luke's Gospel, he records Jesus giving several teachings on piety, meaning acts and practices of faith. So in Luke chapter 10, he records Jesus teaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the pious behavior that Jesus is trying trying to draw out of his disciples is that for love of their neighbor, no matter their background or experience. Luke then records at the end of chapter 10 this interaction of Jesus with Mary and Martha as he and his disciples go to their house for the evening. And Mary gets upset with Martha because she's not helping prepare the table for the guest. The pious behavior there, many believe, is our reason, our purpose for coming together is always to focus on Jesus and him in our lives. And so many believe this is also a teaching on worship. And who do we worship? Who do we focus on? Jesus or somebody else? Which then goes into Luke chapter 11. As we heard at the gospel reading just a a minute ago, it's easy for us to simply focus on what we call the Lord's Prayer. But on doing so, we, we actually miss a lot of what Jesus is teaching his disciples here in Luke chapter 11. So go down with me to verse 9. Jesus says this, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. All right, so Jesus is essentially making a promise to his disciples that God, our Heavenly Father, will also answer our prayers in his amazing grace and generosity towards us. At the end of this section, in verse 13, this is also the first time that Jesus promises his Holy Spirit to his disciples in the Gospel of Luke. Honestly, I've long struggled with this promise in my own life of faith, as I'm sure many of you have. The promise that God will always answer prayers. Because it's pretty easy to dismiss that from a human perspective, isn't it? I mean, how many times have you prayed for something and it hasn't come to be? I'm not talking about the lottery ticket you bought at the gas station this weekend either, okay? But how many times have you prayed for relief from a struggle only to have to endure it for longer? How many times have you prayed for the change of heart in your loved one only to see them do the same things over and over and over again? This is why prayer is a struggle for so many. The reality, though, is the struggle is not with God. The struggle with the, is with us. And the struggle isn't that we're lacking faith or that our prayers aren't fervent enough and we need to try harder. That's not the struggle. Jesus' promise is that God will answer our prayers always. The struggle that we have is what we are actually seeking from God when we turn to him in prayer which is what Jesus addresses at the beginning of Luke chapter 11 in what we call the Lord's Prayer. So go up, Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John has taught his disciples. So Jesus said to them, When you pray, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. See, Jesus is teaching us to start from a place of humility in our practice of prayer. We are to approach God as our Father, as the one who can do what we ask, who can give us what we need, 
who can transform any situation. We are to approach God as our Father, as holy, as set apart, as unique in our life. He's not distant from us. He's not aloof from us. He's not incompetent or unable to do what is asked of us. We are to approach Him as holy. Yet we also approach Him, God our Father, with an intimacy of a child to their loving, nurturing, caring, earthly father. Now, though that many scholars today would translate that as daddy, and it's close, but not quite. Because in this intimate relationship, there's still a holy reverence. There's still a respect. There's still an honor that Jesus uses here. Because God alone is the one who can provide, and he does provide for us, so he alone is the one that we can turn to, and we turn to him in humility, and we come to him in faith and trust as children go to their father. Go to verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread. It's important to note that this is a prayer for sustenance, both presently and but also eternally. And because it's present and eternal, that means it's also physical and spiritual. And so as we intimately turn to God as our Father, we turn to Him for His provision in our lives. And this petition for daily bread is not a petition for things we want in life, but for the things that we need in life. And it's also a humble attempt to align our desires with what God our Heavenly Father ultimately provides to us. And I just want to pause here for a second. Because I'm pretty regularly reminded of just how selfish my prayer life can be. I remember there were nights when the twins were just infants that I would lay in bed during my shift to sleep, somewhere in a three to four hour stint, and I would pray that they would simply stop screaming so that I could sleep more. Yes, I was very sleep deprived. So was Victoria and so were our girls and our other children for that matter. And then I remember a conversation that I had with one of my trusted friends. And their encouragement to to me was, what if I prayed not for more sleep, but for the strength to care for my wife and my twins? It's been a pretty consistent reminder to me in my life when I come to God in prayer. We approach Him in love and humility as our Heavenly Father and and we seek His provision in our life, not so that He aligns with our will and our desire, but so that we align with His. Because what He provides to us is what we actually need in the moment to live out His purpose in our lives. If He has not provided us, we do not need it. He will not give us what we do not need to live out our purpose. That purpose of proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and moving the mission forward. So as you go into that hard conversation with your coworker, as you prepare to have that, you know, talk with your teenager, or you and your spouse need to have that conversation about your budget, or about what you're going to do for that week, or you simply feel like you can't make it for the day, Pray not for what you think you need, but for daily bread. For that which God provides for you to live out His purpose in your life as His disciple. Verse 4. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. God has forgiven sins. He did so in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And and that's what makes this petition so incredibly powerful for us as disciples of Jesus. Because we're not praying for something that we hope or wish will happen. We are prayerfully rejoicing that God already has forgiven us in our Savior Jesus Christ. And we are praying that what God has provided to us, we can provide to others. 
as we seek to live out our lives in his purpose. He gives us what we need to forgive those that he's placed in our lives. And so to clarify a misunderstanding, this is not a petition of, you know, what if, God, what if, just got to throw something crazy out here. What if you forgave me of my sins and then I forgave other people? It's also not a, I know you probably won't, but if you would be so generous and so thoughtful and so kind, I'd really appreciate it if, that's not this petition. This is a petition that, again, seeks to align with God's purpose in our lives. Because he has so generously and lovingly forgiven us, we can approach our Heavenly Father not out of fear, not out of trepidation, but out of humility, knowing in his love and mercy he has already done this. And as he has forgiven us, you and I are now set free to forgive and love and be even merciful to those in our lives who need his love and forgiveness, just as much as you and I do. So not only do we rejoice in our forgiveness in this petition, we also align ourselves with God's purpose in our lives and seek his strength to forgive those that he's given to us. But notice that Jesus' teaching on the practice of prayer with his disciples doesn't simply stop with what we call the Lord's Prayer. It continues. And this next part is incredibly important for our own sacred rhythm of prayer as disciples of Jesus and understanding this rhythm in our lives. Go down to verse 5. And Jesus said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And that friend will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, his honor, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. See, the behavior that Jesus highlights here would be absolutely unthinkable in first century Jewish culture. The idea that a man would not help his friend in need is simply outlandish. Because in a culture governed by honor and shame, the last thing a friend would do would be allow his friend in need to be shamed because he couldn't provide for his guests as they came into his house. Because not only would his friend be shamed, but also his entire family would be shamed for not being able to entertain that guest. And then not only would his friend and his family be shamed, but the one who refused to help would also be shamed. And all of his family with him. Jesus uses this to highlight why God keeps his promise to answer our prayers. It's a matter of integrity and character for him. With us, his beloved, holy, and set-apart people. And because it's a matter of integrity and character for him with us, it's also the witness of his name throughout the world. God will not let his own name and character be shamed by not doing what he has promised to do. Provide for our every need, presently and internally and doing so in great generosity and love. Again, we can trust in God's promise to be faithful to us, not because we are so faithful, but because He is. His name is to be set apart, to be kept holy, to, to be hallowed among us, and this is accomplished by God doing exactly what He has promised to do. Not only in the death and resurrection of our Savior, for our salvation, but also in our daily life as his disciples and him giving us everything we need to live our lives in his purpose. Go back to verse 9. This is why Jesus says, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, 
It'll be opened. So let me encourage you and challenge you as a disciple of Jesus in your rhythm of prayer. Number one, pray as he has taught you. The Lord's Prayer, as recorded here in Luke 11, or as we're going to study in Bible study today in Matthew 6, is obviously a prayer that we can use in our daily life, not just in Sunday morning worship. And that's true because it comes from the very heart of our Savior. But it can also serve as an outline to lead us in our own prayer life. So maybe one day this week, focus on the first petition. Our Father, who, is, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And you can bring all the ways to God that you are seeking to keep him as the center and focus of your life. And even all of the ways that you're struggling to do so. You can do the same with the other petitions. For example, and forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Gracious God, help me with that coworker this week. The one that just keeps annoying me and frustrating me and scowling at me in meetings. Lord, as I often have not shown your mercy to the world, forgive me. But strengthen me now to show that mercy to my coworker. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Gracious God, give me strength to wake up because it is Monday morning and I don't want to go anywhere. The sun's not up yet. Lord, help me. Help me. Give me the strength I need for this day. You can use it as a prayer in and of itself. You can use it as an outline. Pray as our Lord has taught us. Number two, pray regularly. And I don't mean you have to sit on your knees, close your eyes, and fold your hands. Remember how Jesus started his teaching of prayer? Father. You know, as a dad, the moments that I love the most are when my kids simply come up to me, give me a hug, they say something really quick, often I can't understand what they're trying to tell me, and then they scurry away. We can do this throughout our day with God because he's already present with us in every experience anyways. His spirit lives within us and, and prays for us in ways we can't always understand, as Paul says in Romans 8. So just go ahead and pray regularly. Lord, thank you for this moment. Lord, thank you for the sunshine. Lord, give me the strength to make it five more minutes through this meeting. Lord, help me with my coworkers. as they scowl at me across the table. Lord, I love this song. It reminds me of you. All of those are prayers. And all of those are prayers because this is a rhythm of faithfulness, not perfection. See, God doesn't invite us into the rhythm of prayer because we do it perfectly with such beautiful language and, and such outlandish vocabulary. He invites us into prayer because we are his beloved children that he desires to interact with daily and to lavish us in his grace and his mercy. So pray regularly. And lastly, write it down. Maybe you don't do this one all the time. Maybe you do. Personally, I have found a prayer journal an incredible way to look back on the prayers that I've brought to God and to rejoice in the amazing ways that he's answered them. Sometimes it's almost immediately, sometimes it's weeks later, sometimes it's even years later. One time I flipped through a prayer journal and there was a rejoicing from a prayer I had made four years previously. Write it down. Write down your prayers and your praises, your, your opportunities to rejoice, not as an act of piety, but as a reminder to you of God's faithfulness in your life. Because after all, Jesus reminds us, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? His most precious name. Amen.